looking at how we collect information and assessment and how we prioritize folks based on that information. We're fine tuning it based upon what the person needs when they need it. Collect information beyond just what gives you that score to make the decision about who moves. We need to figure out how to make the most with what it is that we have. I think we'll all be learning together on this one for a while. Can you all hear me in the back? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for being here. Um, this particular session, um, Susan and George and I, um, sorry, I'm Abby uh, from the SNAP's office. Susan and George and I uh, went through multiple iterations of this, and these are new ideas um, that we're hoping work for you. Um, but we don't have all the answers on this. Um, we don't have all the answers on a lot of things, but we really don't have all the answers on this one. <laughs> so um, please ask questions, like turn it over, try to poke holes in it. And um, I think we'll all be learning together on this one for a while. Thank you. Welcome. I hope that you have found uh, a support group here. Uh, and that uh, you are making the contacts so that when you go back to your community, uh, you can reach out to people and know that you're not alone in this work, right? There's 402 or whatever we're up to, other COCs who are all engaged in this work and 402 HMIS sysadmins, right, who are all doing this too. So uh, this morning, we are going to spend our time uh, together talking about using coordinated entry data to serve the most vulnerable households. Uh, I should have introduced myself, sorry. Hi, Susan Starrett with CSH, uh, um, the Associate Director of the Federal Technical Assistance Team at CSH, uh, HUD Technical Assistance Provider, and I've been here almost about five years. Prior to coming to CSH, I ran Delaware Statewide Continuum of Care and was also the HMIS lead there and implemented coordinated entry uh, in our community. I think as we're talking about coordinated entry to serve the most vulnerable, a couple of things to keep in mind. Have you all figured this out? Anybody figured out how to serve the most vulnerable? Darn, I was hoping you wouldn't get to come up here and present. All right, so some of the things that we're gonna be presenting today are four different things that communities are trying. Uh, it's not down to a science yet, right? None of this that we do is down to a science. And so everything that we're gonna talk about today are things that are promising practices that communities are trying. Things like uh, creating your own assessment tool based upon the needs and the indicators of the people experiencing homelessness in your community. Things like phased assessments, uh, progressive engagement and dynamic prioritization. So uh, we're gonna spend a bit of time identifying what those key assessment indicators are, how they relate to the assessment process. We're gonna talk about inflow management, dynamic system management principles, and then give you all an opportunity to really think about the data that you're collecting and how that has impacted or is impacting both your inflow and your prioritization standards. And it, are those practices in your community reflective of the needs of people experiencing homelessness? Okay, so I think what we wanna do today is to start off with you kind of doing a little self-evaluation. So that document that you have in front of you is the Dynamic System Management Worksheet. We're just gonna give you a few minutes individually to walk through this and if anybody needs some yep Uh, okay, so I think everybody's had a chance to fill out the, the worksheet. Um, I'm just going to talk for a minute. That worksheet, I think, says at the top, uh, I think it might have the words um, dynamic system management. So what dynamic system management is, is a collection of practices um, that Abby just mentioned that uh, HUD hopes 
communities will look at to make their coordinated entry systems work better. So as you saw in the worksheet, there are practices associated with each of the four core elements of coordinated entry, access, assessment, prioritization, and referral, okay? Today, we're gonna talk specifically about a few of those, we're gonna talk specifically about a few elements that Susan mentioned at the beginning uh, that are associated with the elements of assessment and prioritization. The reason why we're gonna focus on those is because <clears throat> when HUD is talking to communities um, around the country, or Susan and I working with communities around the country, um, that, you know, as Susan started off, she asked, who's got this whole coordinated entry thing figured out yet? Nobody raised their hand, right? We know, we, we know that nobody is doing this perfectly, um, but the areas that we see that folks are really kind of struggling with the most are under this assessment and prioritization, right? A lot of us are doing a great job setting up our access points. We're doing, you know, we're doing a pretty good job making referrals. We all wish we could have more resources to make referrals too, but, but we're, we're doing a pretty good job at that. But we need to do a lot more work looking at how we collect information and assessment and how we prioritize folks based on that, in, that information in the prioritization step. So that's why we're going to focus on, on those core elements today. And I'm going to get us started off by talking a little bit about assessment. So I want to clarify um, a few things about assessment. I think a lot of us conflate assessment and prioritization to make them mean, to make them sort of mean the same thing. The assessment step in coordinated entry is all about gathering information, right? I'm seeing a lot of head nods, so people, people agree, that's good. Um, uh, and so how do we gather that information? We ask questions of our clients, we gather information in other ways as well, and I know almost everybody in this room, their, their mind is immediately going to, yeah, I've got an assessment tool, right? I've got this figured out, we're good on this. Because um, how many of us have an assessment tool that we use as part of our coordinated entry project process, right? Assessment tools are a very helpful tool to help us collect the information that we need at this step of coordinated entry. However, we want to start thinking about whether our assessment tools that we're using <clears throat> are gathering the information that we need. Are they gathering information that we don't even need to use later on in the process? And are they dictating everything about our prioritization scheme? Okay. So assessment tools are definitely helpful in identifying the housing and service needs of our clients. And most assessment tools that folks use generate a score. And that score can be useful in informing you know, the severity of need, needs of our clients compared to one another. However, there is no one tool that HUD endorses um, that you know, is supposed to solve all your assessment needs for you. You should always be looking at the assessment tools you're, you're using to make sure that they are collecting um, the indicators we need, <clears throat> you will need to use as part of the next step in coordinate, coordinated entry, which is the prioritization process. So what are those indicators that we need to collect? There's three big areas that we want folks to remember that the assessment process should be collecting information on. The vulnerability of our clients, the service needs of our clients, and what are their barriers? So we're gonna walk through each of these and I'm gonna sort of give some examples of the type of indicators that we want to be, uh, to be collecting under each of these. So for vulnerability, we might want to be gathering information about what is the unsheltered situation of clients, what is the, you know, especially for our youth and children and families, what's the history of victimization while homeless, do, they, do the clients have any prior history in the foster care system, and do they, are they engaging any, in any high-risk behaviors. We also want to collect um, indicators for service needs. Do our clients have an inability to complete activities of daily living? Do they have records of heavy healthcare usage and needs? That was something that just came up a lot when we were talking about the last section as well. Uh, is there a, a, a pattern of hospitalization or inpatient treatment? Uh, and is there a history of not being able to maintain stable housing? And then finally, we also want to collect indicators for barriers to housing, right? So lack of a leasehold, lack of a rental history is a really big one. A history of eviction is something that we see a lot, right? 
the history of violent, drug-related, drug or sex offense history, what is the criminal history, lack of employment history or current employment, lack of credit, or bad credit history. These are the types of things that we want to be making sure that our assessment tools and our assessment processes are gathering information on. Whether you're using a tool that is provided, to, that, um, that is created by a third party, some communities are creating their own assessment tools, and you know, whichever route you're taking to do that, you should be making sure that these, these types of indicators are the ones that you're collecting information on. Can I just see a show of hands? Has anybody, you all raised your hand that you're using an assessment tool. So has anybody very intentionally looked at all of the questions on your assessment tools, tool tools, to make sure that the information that you're collecting is actually matching the needs of people experiencing homelessness in your community? Like, have you taken that next step to say, are these the actual questions that we should be asking? Okay, few hands. I think that there's some communities out there uh, that we've worked with that are in the process right now of doing that and are finding that their assessment tools are showing uh, disparities uh, uh, on how uh, people are being scored or uh, you know assessed for services and housing interventions. So I would just really recommend that you all take a very intentional look at the assessment tools that you are using, going back to what are the key things that are indicators for high for vulnerability, service needs, and barriers. Are we asking the right questions? It doesn't have to be the laundry list. It doesn't have to be everything. We're going to talk about this in the phased assessment process too, right? Like uh, figuring out where what you need to ask and when, super important, right? Uh, and so, it again, it doesn't have to be everything. The idea with phased assessment is that we are, com we are collecting information from clients. We are collecting only the information we need to move to the next step of the phased assessment process. We start with an initial triage, which is an assessment, right? What kind of things are we looking at in an initial triage? What, what kind of questions are we asking ourselves or the clients? Do you need to go to the hospital? Right? This is like emergency, sir. Like, do, it, are, are, is this the best place for you to be with me, a homeless service provider? We might go into the, the next phase, which could be diversion, right? Diversion is how can, we, how can we solve the problem of your housing crisis, right? How can we solve that right away with the resources that you have on hand? Do you have any money? Do you have a social network, family members? How, how, can we, how can we solve this without having to move on to the next step in our phased assessment process where, where things kind of start to get a little bit more complex, right? The next step is intake. This is where we're intaking our client into our homeless response system, right? We're entering their, we're, we're, we might be entering their information into HMIS or another system related to coordinated entry, okay? Then we might give them an initial assessment so this is, this is where we're gathering more detailed information about those indicators that we just talked about, okay? We might have other steps in this process, like a potential eligibility assessment, where we're asking specific questions about trying to determine whether the client will be eligible for the programs that we, that we as a community have, okay? And then the final possible step, at least in this example, is a comprehen comprehensive assessment, a service needs assessment. So I'm gonna ha we're gonna try to house this client. What are their services that they might need so that we can create a housing plan for them? In phase assessment, we're not, try we're not trying to ask for the same information again at every step. We build on the information that we collected in the previous step. The other thing is that I like to think of these arrows in this diagram of, of trying to get someone to this house, right? These are, all, these are all places where somebody theoretically, we could house someone, we could resolve their housing crisis. So if, if we can resolve someone's housing crisis by having a uh, problem solving conversation with them as part of diversion and maybe getting them to move back in with a family member who they had been staying with previously, we shouldn't be doing all these other steps. We shouldn't be going through, we shouldn't be having the huge assessment process. That's a lot of energy from us, right? And it can be traumatic for the client. 
So that, that's, that's a big focus of, of what we're trying to do here. Okay. You could completely skip prioritization altogether at any point in this process if they don't need resources, other housing resources from the homeless crisis response system. All right, so we're gonna switch gears a little bit and we're gonna talk about progressive engagement. This is an opportunity when we are not doing business as usual, right? Business as usual in our homeless response system has been, we have a standardized set of services and housing intervention that we are going to offer to everyone that comes to us. That doesn't work for folks, we know that, right? So instead what we need to do is we need to think about how we can offer the least amount of assistance until folks are telling us that they need more, okay? So that's what progressive engagement is. We're gonna start out in this like kind of tiered approach of offering some basic level of support and then we're gonna progress to more support if and when uh, they are not able to maintain their housing without additional support. Uh, and we can grow that from there. So a couple of key things uh, to think about related to progressive engagement. That this is both a service typology and it is a culture shift, right? So in terms of a service typology, the important thing to think about is that it is uh, how we are offering services and housing assistance. In terms of a culture shift, it's the, guess what? They don't actually need us. Right? Not everyone needs us in the same way. Hard for case managers, right? But it's okay because we're still offering them what it is that they need. We may not have the same successes uh, as uh, what we do in our current system where we're like throwing the kitchen sink at them, um, but we're still going to have successes. We really celebrate those folks who self-resolve on their own, but we don't learn from that, right? We don't look at our data to see how many people actually self-resolve. And guess what? When we looked at this, 25% of the people in our shelter self-resolved within 14 days. 25%. They did not need anything more from us. So we need to be able to look at our data and to be able to offer them what they need when they need it, um, but not to go beyond that at all times, right? There's a push to make this the most impact possible with the resources that we have. Does everybody have enough rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing in your community to serve everyone? Right now, and we're, we're uh, maybe some community as well, right? <laughs> But that's, uh, that's hard to foresee that in the future. So instead, what we need to do is we need to figure out how to make the most with what it is that we have, right? It's not saying that we're going to offer everybody like this much and then they're done, right? We want to make sure that there's not the cliff. If they're not able to create that bridge on their own, we can't have a cliff, right? So we still want to create that bridge, but sometimes that bridge may only be a one-foot bridge and sometimes it might be a 25-foot bridge, right? We want to begin, as I said, begin with the most basic support possible and then move through different levels. I like to think about this as uh, radio dials, right? So if you think about your old tuner that some of us might still have in our houses um, that have the volume button and then the tuner button, right? Maybe even some of our cars still have this. Think about two different types, two different um, kind of sets of dials, right? So you have a set for your service supports and you have a set for your housing assistance. They can move independently of each other. We can offer a different level of service at the same time that we're offering a different level of housing assistance. And then within each of those, we can also turn up the volume, turn up the intensity, as well as at the same time that we're offering different services, right? So the dials can also move independently of each other. That's the type of system that we're talking about. That's the type of services that we're talking about within our homeless response system through progressive engagement is that we're not turning the volume all the way up because that will blast everybody, right? But that we're, we're tuning it in, we're fine tuning it based upon what the person needs when they need it. 
And again, we can do that separately with our housing assistance and with our services. Um, and we also, as a homeless crisis response system, cannot provide every type of service that there is out there. So we need to make sure that we are collaborating with all of our partners and that they're able to tune their service provision up and down as it's needed. Um, and as I talked about, we need data to be able to support this. I'm going to be very honest, right, that we don't quite know what data to use to determine all the time, uh, how we, how um, we can figure it out kind of at the individual level, right? Like the case manager is working with them, we, we can do that. It's hard to predict when specific uh, cohorts or percentages of people and what they're gonna need, which means that it makes it really hard to budget. Okay, makes it really hard for your providers to be like, I'm gonna provide this many months of assistance to this percentage of people, so I only need to budget $5,000. And then I'm gonna provide this amount to this you know, percentage of people. We're not quite there yet in figuring it out, which does mean that as USICH has said, that we need flexible resources <laughs> to be able to support that, um, both in terms of money and staffing structure. Uh, and we need to create relationships with landlords as we're talking about rapid rehousing or if somebody needs to move into a permanent supportive housing because our assistance might vary over time. This is where shallow subsidies may also come into play, right? Um, providing links to other services, managing that flexible program requires a skill level of our program managers, creating partnerships with clients so that they're, we're, they're making realistic plans for both services and their housing. Um, and then there's a messaging piece to this, right? It goes back to how are we communicating? How are we messaging what the system is going to be able to provide to someone and not over-promising? All right, so baseline, right? Prioritization, what is it in our process? It's the, it's the process where we're taking the needs and the level of vulnerability and we're quantifying them and, and comparing them, or right? Like how are they in relation to other people who are also seeking assistance at the same time, right? So we're using the information that we've learned from the assessment process. It's helping us to manage the inventory, uh, making sure that we're not creating thousand people on wait lists. Uh, and it ensures that those with the greatest needs are the one who are able to more quickly access the services that they need to resolve their housing crisis. I'm gonna skip some slides also. Um, this came up before, uh, so I just, I'm gonna just put this up here. I'm gonna say a few words about it uh, so that you keep it in mind. But uh, during prioritization, we have to follow laws, right? We have to follow our fair housing laws, uh, American with Disabilities Act, 504, right? Like we got lots of things that we have to also be thinking about. And in terms of prioritization, you are not allowed to have a prioritization process that discriminates based on any of the protected classes and make sure that you're including your locally protected classes as well as a part of that process, right? It is a violation of the civil rights laws if your prioritization process is based solely on a score that is produced by an assessment tool that consistently provides a higher score to persons with specific disabilities over those with other disabilities. So if you have a process where you are scoring mental health, physical health, Developmental disabilities, certain conditions, no. So most prioritization process goes something like this, right? You have a score, zero to in this case, or one to 18. You're saying that in your community, a score of five to 10 will score for rapid rehousing and a score of 11 to 18 scores for permanent supportive housing. But because you don't have enough rapid rehousing and because you don't have enough permanent supportive housing, what ends up happening is those with a score of maybe 13.5 to 18 actually get permanent supportive housing. 
And those with a score of seven to 10 actually get rapid rehousing. And what happens to your 11 to 13s? They sit on your wait list, right? And if you only have turnover of two units a month, long time, right? So we're not taking into account any of our resource availability as a part of this process normally. We create long wait lists and those folks just sit on the wait list or in shelter with no housing plan or on the street, depending on your community. We're assuming that there's a single pathway out of homelessness. Uh, the information becomes quickly outdated if people are staying on the wait list forever, right? Um, and interestingly enough, our lower need individuals are getting housing resources before the higher needs. So are we actually prioritizing people with the highest needs? No, right? So instead, what we wanna do is create a dynamic prioritization approach that considers information in real time and seeks to ensure that the most vulnerable being prioritized for the resources, achieving housing placements quickly. You have to decide what quickly means in your community, but <laughs> right, like the Hearth Act tells us that a high performing community is 30 days or less. Allow for flexible housing placement decisions and continue to utilize problem solving approaches throughout the entire process. So here's the difference of how dynamic prioritization looks compared to static. In dynamic prioritization, what we are doing is we are looking at our turnover and both in rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing. And we're saying, okay, so within a whatever time period that was that we decided, right, that we wanted, was it 30 days, 45 days, 60 days? We're gonna take a look at that window of time, let's say 90 days. And within 90 days, chunks, as we're looking back at our data, we have had 30 units turnover during that time frame, kind of consistently over those 90 day time periods. So we're gonna start with the number of 30. And we're gonna take a look at, at that point in time, uh, ha the highest uh, identified, highest prioritized 30 people on our list. You may do a little bit more because maybe somebody has found other housing resources, maybe, right, like you can't find them, whatever. So maybe you do 35 or 40, depending on what that looks like in your community. And you are going to offer those 30 people housing resources, okay? Maybe if you're also doing progressive engagement and you have more rapid rehousing resources available in your community, some of these higher scored folks may also be accessing rapid rehousing and through progressive engagement, you'll make a determination of whether or not they need PSH at some point in time. But those most highly vulnerable folks are being housed first in your community. Then if you have more turnover than those 30 units, you're going back to that prioritization list that is not a thousand people long wait list, right? You're going back to your, all of your assessments and you're looking at, you're creating another list at that point of people. And you're gonna do that every month. You're gonna do that as your turnover is coming available, right? Every 90 days, whatever that time period is that you determined. Okay, so you don't have a list that just sits there. People aren't asking what their number is on the list because you're recreating a list every, whatever again, whatever that time period was, every 90 days. I'm gonna make a quick point. Um, and Susan talked about this, but you'll see there's arrows. So people aren't tied by a score to a specific intervention. This person scored eight, so they have to get rapid rehousing, right? So I just wanna tie this back to when I was talking about assessment, you're gonna need, you know, if for this to happen, you're gonna to need to have, a, have some collect information beyond just what gives you that score to make the decision about who moves in those arrows, right? So just trying to like connect this mm -hmm. to the discussion we had around assessment. I think the other thing, and I did skip this, but I'll go back to it just really quickly, right? Is that it really is, you need to think about your prioritization criteria and what you're using because prioritization is not just the score from your assessment tool. There are other factors that you should be considering when you're thinking about prioritization. 
Um, so it could be things like, as Amanda was talking about, right? Those folks who have been on the street, uh, the length of time that they've been experiencing homelessness, uh, the severity of their service needs, if they're linked or engaged to other service providers or not, right? So you can fit, you need to be figuring this out, but it goes beyond just your assessment score. The conversation is that we're gonna be here to support you for as long as you need, both in service and in housing assistance. Um, and we're gonna have a regular conversation monthly conversation, whatever that is, right? About what those needs are and as they fluctuate, then we're gonna keep having that open dialogue about what it is that right, can be provided and what you need. It's a conversation.